Fort Delaware, located across the Delaware River from the Pocono Mountains in Narrowsburg, New York, is a replica of a mid-18th century frontier-era fort. In the 1750s, the entire Delaware River region, including the Pocono and Catskill Mountains, was a part of an untamed wild frontier, rich with natural resources. We're very fortunate, I think, in Sullivan County and in the Upper Delaware, uh, including uh, the portion of Pennsylvania, to have a really rich and colorful history, and it dates back to colonial times. During early colonial times, settlers would leave the East Coast populated cities and build frontier settlements in hopes of finding their fortunes. The first settlement on the Upper Delaware region was known as Cushatunk. So the Europeans have this 30 mile long settlement and they set up little groups of homes all along this 30 miles, so it's fairly sparsely populated. And they begin to solicit other settlers to come. A lot going on in North America at the time. French and Indian War, tension between Native American tribes, and so the prudent thing for them to do would be to build a stockade to protect portions of the settlement. And people who didn't live within the stockade could be summoned in in the event of trouble by using a signal cannon or something uh, similar to that. And so around 1760, they actually build two fortifications. They're called the Lower Fort and the Upper Fort. One is near present-day Milanville, and one was up near Calicoon. The Lower Fort at present-day Milanville is what is approximated uh, by the creation of Fort Delaware. The Cushatunk settlement thrived from the 1750s until the beginning of the Revolutionary War in 1775. Between 1775 and 1783, many of the settlers of Cushatunk, who were loyal to Great Britain, left to fight the war. Following the Revolutionary War, most of the loyalists that fought against the American Patriots moved to Canada, and although some of the Patriots returned to Cushatunk, the population of the settlement dwindled and was eventually abandoned, leaving the buildings and the lower fort to disintegrate. There's very little that remains today if not for places like Fort Delaware that uh, have taken up the mantle of telling that story, of, of reminding us what it was once like here. Um, without that, probably uh, the, the early history of the Upper Delaware would be largely forgotten, and that would be a great, a great loss to us, I think, um, for a lot of reasons. In the late 1950s, the Sullivan County historian at the time, James Burbank, saw an opportunity to bring the history of the Cushatunk settlement to life. Automobile ownership was at an all-time high, and Americans were looking for interesting places to travel by car. So Burbank decided to build Fort Delaware to highlight the local frontier history and as a tourist attraction. The parallel story to the colonial history of Fort Delaware is what I consider a fascinating tale of the 1950s. It's the story of James W. Burbank's creation of Fort Delaware as a replica, as a reproduction of this lower fort, and the research that he did into the story and how he framed the story of the Cushatunk settlement with the influences and the backdrop of 1950s America, where the automobile has given new freedom to people to travel and to seek out theme parks and amusement parks and roadside attractions. America's swept over by the Davy Crockett craze thanks to the Walt Disney television production with Fess Parker. And so when Burbank opens Fort Delaware in 1957, it's kind of the buckskin version of our colonial history. In fact, we have photos of him in the, the leather fringe outfit and the coonskin cap. So it was right out of the, the Davy Crockett series. Uh, but his attempt was to tell the colonial history of the area. What was it like? The very simple life of the common man. How did they live? What kind of skills did they need uh, in order to survive? So when you go to Fort Delaware, even to this day, many years after Burbank 
has been long gone from the fort. Many of his ideas survive there, so we have skills like candle making being demonstrated. There are actually three cabins constructed within the stockade, and the cabins are designed to tell the story of the evolution of the settlement. So the first cabin that you see is a very crude, small, primitive structure with a dirt floor, one room, a very simple fireplace, and then you could see as the as the settlers accumulated a little affluence, as they became more permanently uh, settled here, the second cabin is a little bit more elaborate, a little larger, has a separate uh, sleeping loft, a little bit more elaborate fireplace, a, a wooden floor, and then the third cabin is is even larger yet, with very elaborate hearth, with a cooking oven, a couple of different sleeping quarters, actually glass in the windows. So it's a much different type of setup. And again, the idea is to tell the story of how the settlement evolved. Fort Delaware was originally built here in 1957 to uh, highlight the lives of uh, people from the Cushitunk settlement that lived here between 1755 and 1785. As you come in, you'll come in through the visitor center, there's the gift shop, there's some of that Burbank ephemera in there, the, there's a, the diorama of his original concept fort that's in there. But then as you come in, you'll see our heirloom garden, you'll see the three cabins that are on the inside here. And the three cabins, uh, we have them set up so that they represent three decades. So the first cabin being the Skinner cabin represents the 1750s when the, the original settlers came. The second cabin is the 1760s where you see an increase in material goods and wealth. And then the 1770s cabin, the final cabin, kind of starts to look into the more of the influx of ideas, especially revolving around the revolution. Moving on from there, we would go to the blacksmith shop, and then from there we would move on to either a cooking demonstration, so you'd have outdoor cooking, including our bread oven, and then from there to weaving and woodworking. Finally wrapping it up with the blockhouse on the far end, which is basically the defensive position. The whole purpose of a stockaded fort or a blockhouse was defense. Fort Delaware consists of several buildings within the stockade, with reenactors bringing the 18th century alive. The mission of Fort Delaware is telling the stories of the Upper Delaware region and preserving local history. I think history is becoming less and less important. It, it doesn't get the emphasis in school that it once did. And so it becomes more important for public historians like myself and lots of volunteers who have taken up the mantle of telling these stories to do just that. We need to fill in that gap. And so places like Fort Delaware, in addition to being great places of entertainment, uh, tours attractions and places where kids can go and have fun, it, it can teach very valuable lessons, not just about the skills that were necessary for survival. How did you make tools? How did you grow food? How did you make candles for light? Just how did you live in general? But also the story behind the history. What brought people here? You know, the drive to own land, the importance of the river, the importance of, of timber, and how those extractive industries led to the growth of these settlements and the affluence of the settlers that kept them in place. What happened during the war? What happened to the people during the war? and in the aftermath of the war. These are all great stories, and they're stories that exist on many different levels. And I think people who are coming to Fort Delaware get to learn history on several levels, depending on their level of interest. Another story we tell at Fort Delaware is the story of the public house and the role that that played in the settlement. Uh, how the tavern, in addition to being a place where people came to, to have fun and to entertain themselves, how it becomes a place where news is disseminated, how it becomes a place where uh, governmental transactions take place. If you had a town hall meeting, it's held in the tavern, in the public house. Kids would go to school in the public house. 
certainly not every single day, but a few days a month, they'd gather there for lessons because it was critically important, believe it or not, for, for kids to learn to read and write, if nothing else. It also was where church services would have been held. So we, we tell the story of the public house. That's a, a great part of the, of the lesson there. Why did you have a, a, an armory? Why did you have communal weapons? Why, why was the stockade constructed in the first place? These are all stories that are important to know, to understand what life was like for our ancestors and to understand from where it was that we came. Keeping history alive and educating future generations is one of the most important reasons to support places like Fort Delaware where people can experience historically accurate living history. To support Fort Delaware, you need to support the Delaware Company. That's the actual entity that operates the fort. Uh, the Delaware Company is a nonprofit history education group. We were formed back in 2012, so we've been in existence for, for 10 years now. Every contribution that you make financially is tax deductible, and we welcome financial contributions. You can either mail us a check, or you can go on our website, thedelawarecompany.org. There's a donate button, and you can either donate a single donation, or you can make it a monthly or yearly donation that will repeat itself. If you wanted to mail a check, our uh, mailing address is The Delaware Company, Post Office Box 88 in Barryville, New York, 12719. Uh, we also need volunteers. Uh, just contact us. Go on the website. There's a, a contact button there. We'd love to hear from you. We're only um, able to accomplish what we can accomplish with our partners. So we need uh, the support of, of people as much as we can get it. Hi, I'm Lorraine Collins, president of Davis R. Chant Realtors. And I'm Abby pittenger Claus, vice president of Davis R. Chant Realtors. Chant has been serving the Lake Wall and Pawpack region for over 58 years, and we are proud to say we sell more homes by volume than any other real estate company in Northeast Pennsylvania. We are coming off our strongest year in the Lake Region real estate market, selling over $430 million in sales volume. We work with sellers to put together a thoughtful but aggressive marketing plan tailored to each home individually. Each of our property listings gets a virtual tour and is professionally photographed, giving the prospective buyer the best first impression. The Lake Wall and Popback area is an attractive place to live because of its low taxes, great school districts, and beautiful scenery. Our team of agents here at Davis Archant Realtors has extensive knowledge in the local real estate market. We have experience with everyone from first-time home buyers to experienced investors. Chant uses a variety of print media, billboards, open houses, and national real estate websites to promote properties and reach potential buyers. Here at Chant, we know that working together and providing channels of communication and feedback is important for the best outcome when selling your home. If you are ready to relocate, upgrade, downsize, or know anyone who's considering the Lake Region area, please stop by one of our CHAN offices or call us at 570-226-4518 or visit us online at chantre.com. If you were to have a conversation with your body, what would that conversation sound like? I'm not functioning at full capacity. I need a vitamin boost. I'm not getting the right nutrients. Yeah, probably something like that. Revive and Refresh Health offers IV vitamin therapy a non-pharmaceutical path to nourishing your body, mind, and mental well-being. They offer customized IVs to ensure you receive the nutrients your body needs. Call or visit for a consultation today. For over 27 years, a group of intrepid paddlers explore the Delaware River and its tributaries during the third week of June. These river nomads, referred to as sojourners, paddle different sections of the Delaware River every year. The term sojourn means to stay for a temporary period of time in a place. For seven or sometimes eight days per year, paddlers of every age, race, 
and orientation come together to experience paddling on the last undammed river in the eastern United States. The Delaware River is divided into four sections, the upper, middle, lower, and tidal Delaware River. The upper Delaware flows from the headwaters in upstate New York to Port Jervis, New York. Below Port Jervis, down to the Delaware Water Gap, is the Middle Delaware. And the Lower Delaware is the longest and most populated section of the river, stretching from the Delaware Water Gap down to Trenton, New Jersey. Everything below Trenton is the tidal section of the river. Every year, the Delaware River Sojourn spends a couple of days in each section of the river. I like it because you see so many different parts of the river, from the very scenic wilderness on the north to down in the, to the tidal regions. It's just a variety, and with all the support, it's always safe, it's always fun. We get too much to eat sometimes, but outside of that, it's all good. Known for its excellent water quality and diverse populations of wildlife, unique natural areas and scenic vistas, and historic towns along its shores, the Delaware River is truly one of our greatest national treasures. Following this water trail provides opportunities to see eagles, hawks, heron, beavers, otters, black bear, red fox, deer, and many other animals in their natural habitats. While anyone can paddle the river on their own, the Delaware River Sojourn offers many advantages that help take the guesswork out of the trip. Kayak, food, safety team, shuttles, and camping locations are provided. All you need to do is bring your tent, trailer, or RV to sleep in, along with any other personal essentials or items to make the experience more enjoyable. The Sojourn offers catered meals, including vegetarian and gluten-free options. If you would like to bring your own boat to paddle, transportation is provided. Each section of the river has its own group of day planners who know their sections of the river extremely well. The days are planned to minimize travel, create a unique on-water experience, eat locally prepared meals, educate paddlers on each section of the river, and provide entertaining or educational evening programs. After all the jack signs, in the boxes. Camping locations often include historic sites, state and national parks, private campgrounds, nature centers, and even museums on occasion. Local festivals and attractions are often incorporated into each day's plans. So, what is a typical day on the Delaware River Sojourn like? There's a comfortable flow to the day, referred to as Sojourn Time. Sojourn Time is the pace that one encounters when the schedules ebb and flow due to nature, weather, or river conditions. As soon as the sun rises in the morning, the camp begins to stir. People check in with Sojourn registration. After check-in, breakfast is served and gear is prepared for the day's paddle. Paddlers are either bust or make their way to the put-in location where their boats are ready and waiting on the shores of the Delaware River. After the morning announcements and the mandatory safety talk and tips for new paddlers, boats are prepared for launch. Participants gather on water around the put-in until all the boats are off the shore and the lead boats whistle signals the start of the day's trip. After a few hours of paddling, enjoying the scenic vistas of the river, the group stops at a predetermined lunch spot. If the location is accessible, hot food is brought in by local caterers, or if the spot is extremely remote, a boxed lunch is provided to each sojourner. During lunch, there's usually an educational or informational program highlighting the section of the river that is being paddled. Following lunch, boats are launched and the afternoon paddle begins. Each paddling day can range from 6 to 15 miles. As the boats reach the takeout location, gear is gathered 
boats are readied for the next day, and sojourners make their way back to camp. And people relax or take a short hike until dinner is served. Dinner is followed by an evening program. Or just sitting around a campfire enjoying the camaraderie of people brought together by the common goal of enjoying, protecting, and conserving the Delaware River for future generations. At some point throughout the day, a River High Admiral Award may be presented to an individual or group in that section of the river who has provided exceptional service to improve quality, protect water or cultural resources, or educate the public on the importance of the Delaware River watershed. After all, the Delaware River provides drinking water to over 15 million people in New York City, Trenton, Philadelphia, and Wilmington. As the day winds down and quiet time in camp starts, sojourners get some much needed rest. One feature that sets the Delaware River Sojourn apart is the National Canoe Safety Patrol, or the NCSP. The Safety Patrol helps new paddlers learn the skills necessary to stay safe on the water and make sure that all boaters wear properly fitting life vests. This makes the sojourn a great trip for inexperienced paddlers who want to improve their skills. When you paddle on the Delaware River Sojourn, and let your imagination wander the historic shores, you find yourself paddling alongside Lenape warriors traveling between villages, past log rafts headed to Philadelphia to become mast for tall ships, witness revolutionary and civil war battles taking place on the banks of the river, and see George Washington crossing the Delaware as the flowing waters carry you through time. The advantage of a sojourn trip like this is that you can paddle for just one or two days or the entire trip. If you need to take a break from paddling for the day, there's always nearby trails to hike, attractions to visit, or you can simply enjoy a quiet day in camp. Each person's connection to the river is different, but the connection to the river is what each sojourner has in common. Being on the Delaware Sojourn is the same as being alive on this earth. We are only in a place for a limited amount of time and we need to make the best of it. Always love, respect, and care for each other as much as possible. And at the end of the day, all you have is your boat, the river, and the people sharing your journey. For more information about the Delaware River Sojourn, visit DelawareRiverSojourn.com. The Sterling Business and Technology Park is currently divided into 23 lots ranging in size from 3 to 30 acres. Each lot in the park is KOZ certified for companies that qualify. The Sterling Business and Technology Park is perfectly located just off exit 17 on Interstate 84 in northeastern Pennsylvania, just under two hours from New York City. If you would like to explore locating your business at Sterling Business and Technology Park, visit sterlingbusinesspark.com. For the largest selection of first quality remnant carpeting for every room in your home, choose Mike's Walk-In Carpet, the only remnant stocking dealer in Wayne County with high quality carpet purchased directly from the manufacturer. With over 40 years experience, you'll get professional service every time. Don't settle for lesser quality carpeting from the big box stores. Choose the best, remnants or special order from Mike's Walk-In Carpet on Route 590, Hawley. The Dorflinger Sudum Wildlife Sanctuary features over 600 acres with five miles of pristine historic walking trails, a natural amphitheater, a small lake, the Dorflinger Glass Museum, and a gift shop. Christian Dorflinger and his factory in White Mills created some of the most beautiful cut glass in the world. The glass Museum and the Wildlife Sanctuary are actually part of a property 
or on the property that was purchased in 1862 by Christian Dorflinger, who was a glassmaker making glass in factories in Brooklyn, New York. Dorflinger moved here with his family, built the factory here, houses for workers, brought workers here, sold off his interests in Brooklyn. And this became the base of operation from the 1860s up until the time the factory closed in 1919, 1921. By 1861, he had produced a uh, set of glassware for the White House for the President and Mrs. Lincoln. So that had kind of established him his, in his reputation for making fine glassware. Fred and Dorothy Sudam took over this property in the 1920s, and it was kind of a second home for them. And they um, made modifications to the old farmhouse. Dorothy Sudam gifted the property to the community, and the wildlife sanctuary was established. The Dorflinger Glass Museum was added a few years later, and the natural amphitheater became the home of the Wildflower Music Festival. We have the Wildflower Music Festival in the summers, and we have about seven or eight concerts every summer in our natural outdoor amphitheater. It is a stunning, beautiful, natural place to come among the giant pines and to bring your picnic dinner. The uh, performances are, uh, I mean, just incredible. I mean, the, the space is, is just a beautiful setting. Sometimes you see, actually, I've seen rabbits cross the stage in the middle of a performance, or deer come up to the edge of the side of the stage, and um, it's just a beautiful setting. Over the years, the Wildflower Music Festival has attracted well-known performers. The best way to experience the beauty of this property is to walk through the grounds and see everything the property has to offer. The 600 acres is just incredibly beautiful and there are just things around every turn on every trail. Um, if you just do the trail around the lake, which is an easy half mile walk, there are views of the, the original farmhouse, there are views in the woods, there are ponds that were put in for waterfowl. It's just, it's just an incredibly peaceful and calming spot. And so that's just the outside. Um, if you decide to come into the glass museum, you see this incredibly beautiful glass made by some of the most talented glass artists in, the, in history, really, um, who were just ordinary people who, with this incredible skill set, making these beautiful pieces that we look at today. The glass museum, festivals, and wildlife sanctuary rely on the support of members and volunteers. We could use new members, we could use new uh, volunteers. Volunteers help us in the museum and in the gift shop. And it's a great chance to come out and see this natural, beautiful gem that we have here in White Mills. The Dorflinger Sudum Wildlife Sanctuary needs your support. Consider becoming a member. If you'd like to learn more about Dorflinger and you can't just stop by, you should go to our website, which is dorflinger.org. You can also call us at 570-253-1185. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and many other social media platforms. We are always looking for new and unusual story ideas, interesting people, and unique events. Send your ideas for the show to Troy at WallyLife.com. If you're a business looking to reach the Northeastern Pennsylvania market using the most powerful media platform available, contact Emily Grillo. Tune in to Wally Life every Monday at 9 p.m. on Blue Ridge Communications Channel 13 for the latest in life around Lake Wallenpawpat.